are listening to Talking Hoosier Baseball, a podcast it's by fans from the iubase.com website. For anyone wanting more information on the Indiana University baseball program. <laughs> Welcome. We are recording this on Wednesday, November 4th, 2020. I am Carl James, joined by stats guru Cassidy Palmer, the creator of iubase.com, Josh Bennett, and the man who types spaces before question marks, Chris Feeney. I caught up with head coach Jeff Mercer earlier today. The Hoosiers are at the midpoint of the fall World Series intra squad. So, coach, uh, if you can just let us know how things are going with the uh, with fall workouts in the fall World Series. Yeah, we're actually, we decided to do an, an extended fall world series. So we'll go a seven game series, which is a lot of fun for the guys, you know, especially after having lost much of the, the year from the season, the summer ball, and also some of the, the, the more fun items that we do with, you know, like morning football and Ironman competition, those things, we've lost some of those. So we felt like going to longer series would be fun for the boys competitively. And also uh, we allow the players to manage the team. So some of the guys are nicked up. So you, you've got the players managing the groups, and, and then putting them in positions to have to make those decisions, which is always fun to to watch uh, to watch some of those antics play out. We had a uh, we had a nine run lead get blown uh, in a seven inning game, which was which was really something. That's really something to watch. Um, and so it's 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 going really well. All the things that we've wanted to accomplish from you know, you know putting guys in uncomfortable positions to have to make some of the decisions they have to make, and, and the players having to be able to. Uh, transition from much more of an individualized portion of the fall where the majority of my focus is just on me and my in my comfortable training environment to now we're out playing with a, a little bit more on the line and, and we're having to manage games and there's pitch counts and limits and all those things so I've been really happy with the way that the group is has uh, has responded to to this to the situations and there's been some bumps along the way where you know we've had some defensive miscues and some base running miscues and, and we've walked too many guys but that you have to go through that. You have to learn and struggle, and, and we have. And uh, I think through that, you 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 gain a, a better appreciation of what it takes to actually be successful. And and that's not uh, 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 solo homers and, and and throwing 97 and striking everybody out. Like right? it's not just the, the the big you know loud plays. It's it's the ability to to, to function and play baseball at a high level with. The ability to throw strikes and the, the ability to, to manage the ball defensively and value outs and, and manage at bats and pitch counts. And so we've gotten a lot better, I think, as we've turned the heat up a little bit in, in a, a little bit more competitive environment. And I'm sure that'll carry forward for us this spring. Who uh, who who calls pitches in, in this type of scrimmage scenario? Well, the, we have the players call all the pitches in the fall. And then as we get back after as we get back after uh, Christmas and, and into the new year, We'll kind of start transitioning into to Justin calling more of the games. We, we like to have, uh, personally, I would love to have the players be able to call their own games in, into the spring. And, and we've dabbled with it at times in the past. It's just really difficult. It's really difficult, to be honest with you, in, in my opinion. And it ultimately ends up being my decision because Justin could go either way. But it's just their schedule as a student athlete, and that's what they are. They're, they're a student athlete. Just in many ways disallows them from doing the requisite research and homework and studying of uh, of an opponent, of the sequences necessary and of the weaknesses necessary to attack, to be able to go out there and, and to memorize those things and, and know those things going into it and be able to execute a game plan like that. So it's just really hard for those guys to spend that much time when you have a, a 20 hour or a 15 hour workload on top of that, which is your main job. So. You know that that's always my thing with with uh, with the pitchers in the fall, where we try to to let them call their own games and the catchers to help them to learn and to, to think the game and and you'll get some really se- some really silly sequences, right? You get some, you know, some uh, if, if Jacob if if another left-handed pitcher throws Jacob Southern another left-handed slider down and in, I'm just going to stop the I'm going to stop the game here because he's hit like four of them over the scoreboard. It's like, at some point, someone's got to stop throwing a cutter off this dude's barrel. So, you know, things like that. And so you, you can get you can get rather offensive, as, as you know, you can get rather offensive really quickly when your defensive shifts are out of alignment 
which is the majority of the fall, it's like, hey, you know the rules, go play baseball. And we try to help, but also have them think without, you know, us being so, so robotic and mechanical. And, and then uh, they can get sideways there with our alignments. And then we can get sideways with our, with our pitch calling as it normally does, including the inability for pitchers to hold base runners uh, without someone saying like, hey, here's a pretty good time to pick over to first. Uh, so those things, we try really hard to uh, let them do on their own in the fall and learn through, the, through those times. And then once we get into the spring, uh, I, I'm pretty adamant about Justin managing that. Now, they've got the ability to shake off. They've always got the ability to shake off. They've got the ability to communicate. They're active participants. We want them to be active participants. So our, our calls are, our shifts are our shifts. Like, this is where I want you to be at. This is what all the numbers say. This is what all the spray charts say. As far as calling a pitch, like, hey, this is our suggestion. If you feel really adamantly otherwise, make your own call. But I, I, I do like it that way. And if, and if we ever get to a point, I think this is important too, if we ever get to a point where we have a catcher um, in a pitching staff that's old enough and, and, and shows the ability to know a scouting report and execute a game plan, then the ideal thing is to have those guys do that. And I'm not saying that, that uh, Colin and Jacob and the guys we have right now aren't capable. We're going to find out into the spring. When I was at, we got Wright State, we had we had Sean Murphy. You know, Sean Sean's with the A's now. Uh, you know, Sean was smart enough to do those things, and so he kind of gave the, the the reins. I didn't, but Justin and Coach Lovely did a little bit more. Where you know, you got a guy that he's, he's been there for three years, and you know he's going to be a big leaguer, and he's a an incredibly intelligent person. It's like he can kind of start to take some of the reins of those. So, and maybe those guys can do it. And if they can, man, that would be great. Just IU football being two and zero and ranked thirteenth in the country. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, it's it's been a lot of fun, uh, you know, as a as a lifelong Indiana fan in general, but a, mm -hmm. a diehard Indiana football and basketball fan to watch you know, from the you know from the outside to to follow the football program so closely in my whole life, and then now to be on the inside and to see kind of the inner workings and to see the investment that the administration and, and obviously the staff have put in not just in the last year or two, but in the last decade. And so now you're starting to see, and you have seen, you've seen seismic shifts, but watching it on the inside, it's like, oh, we're getting a lot better. Like I'm in the house every day. I see it and I see the level of athletes and the training and the speed and the physicality. And obviously the, the coaches do a great job and, and coach Allen is, I mean, there may not be a better person uh, you, that you'll ever meet. What a quality human. And he's so supportive of everything. So it's been a lot of fun to watch the, the football program start to, as they would say, break through and do these things. And that, that's always a, a fun time to, to begin to realize and actualize what you've always think, thought was possible. And I have a unique perspective because I watched IU football games with Antoine Randall and you know, all, all the way through until now and to see the changes, it's really cool. And we hope to be catching up again with Coach uh, after the Fall World Series continues. Now I'm handing it over to Cass to give us some insights on stats for Matt Lickwicky. Thank you, Carl. Uh, so looking at stats, Matt has a, a, a 3.72 ERA uh, on his career at IU. That's in 19 and a third innings of work. But he was cruising in 2020 where he had a 0 .90 ERA in 10 innings. Uh, before COVID ended the season. Uh, one thing that's really nice to see, Matt has only given up five walks compared to striking out 15. I do like to see that. And on his career, uh, he has a 200 batting average against. And in 2020, kind of goes along with that 0.9 ERA, uh, he had a 154 batting average against in 2020. Uh, so Matt, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. All right, Matt, I'll get us started with our questions tonight. Um, you'd only pitched four varsity innings when you committed to IU in 2014. Uh, why was committing so early important to you? I, I don't think committing early was as important as committing to the right place. And in the back of my head, I always knew that I loved Indiana over the guys a little bit north, but uh, I mean, I just kind of, as soon as I started like pulling interest from coaches, I kind of knew 
I didn't want to go too far from home, but I didn't want to be so close to home where I felt like I was still living there. So Indiana was like that perfect fit in that essence. And then I kind of just fell in love with the whole school. And then at that time it was Lamonis and Coach Bunn and Kyle Cheese, bro. And I loved what they had to say and what they had to offer. So I think it was more so not committing early as committing to the right school for me. So, so what other schools were in the mix then? Kind of just big 10 schools. Um, I talked a little bit to like Michigan state. I talked a little bit to Purdue. Nobody really else other than that kind of outside the big 10, but it kind of felt good to commit early and then just kind of like get that settled and know that that's going to be my plan for the next four years. And Matt, you were named conference MVP in 2015 and all conference first team in 15 and 16. What were some of your favorite memories playing at Lake Central High? Lake Central was definitely um, a good learning experience because it wasn't just learning the side of baseball. Our coach really held us to a higher standard the same way that Mercer does at Indiana. So Sandor there definitely helped me a lot just grow up. I think I was a little immature when I first entered high school. And I think that those are some of my favorite memories, like all in all, just like kind of making the friends and like figuring out who I really was going to be. Playing Connor Manis every year in the sectional was pretty fun too, though. I got I to gotta put that one up there too. Plunking him in the head with a curveball. That was kind of fun. Yeah. Oh, those, did you yeah. beat him? Who won? Oh, I beat him one year. And then he single-handedly beat us the next year. I think he uh, he struck out like 15 and then uh, had like four RBIs that day too. So, I mean, you win some, you lose some, and just hate to lose them to him. So, <laughs> Especially now, sure. Now, yeah, uh, now that we're teammates. Right, right. When you, uh, when you weren't pitching, where were you playing uh, what position-wise? I kind of just floated. Uh, I really liked the outfield. Cause I had a buddy in high school who was really good too. He, uh, he actually plays at Purdue right now. His name is Ben Nissel. Playing the outfield with him was a lot of fun just cause we could kind of just throw the ball around the yard a little bit as hard as we wanted. I mean, high school was you put your best arms in the outfield and just let them do their thing. So I think that that was like my favorite position outside pitching was probably just the outfield, any position. Nice. Now you get to shake balls at least, right? BP, I guess. Yeah, actually, uh, freshman year, I gave myself a concussion trying to do that. So. Oh, okay. I <laughs> didn't want to bring that up. <laughs> we laid off that a little bit. <laughs> I bet. I bet. Now, do you miss hitting? Hitting. I never was a good hitter, I guess. Okay. Uh, I do miss it just because, I mean, it's fun knowing, like, the mindset of a pitcher as a hitter. And I'm, I'd imagine vice versa, but not as much as I miss playing the outfield, to be honest. Okay. okay. Uh, your name was uh, coming up as a possible MLB draft selection after your senior year. Uh, did you consider bypassing college at any point? Um, only if it was some outlandish number that I was offered, honestly. Uh, I knew that I wanted to get a degree. I kind of I took that very seriously I know my mom did too same thing with my dad so I would say that the only thing that would really take me out of the mindset of going to college baseball would be some outrageous number okay um did did uh did you get any uh interest any specific contacts I threw bullpens for a couple scouts in high school but I never really pursued I guess the whole getting drafted out of high school as much as some guys I know did. But so I, I did talk to a couple, but I never really put my head in the ring, I guess. Now, Matt, uh, after coming to Bloomington, you missed a season due to Tommy John surgery. We hear about this injury a lot. Uh, when did you find out it was going to be needed? I found out I came... I came to Indiana 
that summer before your freshman year so you can get some lifts in and get throwing and kind of get used to living a college campus and um we were kind of just going through the throwing program that coach Bunden provided for us and I knew that I knew that my form was starting to feel a little not weak but it would kind of get real tight really quick and I went to our trainers we were talking for a while they um tried to prolong the surgery just because I mean nobody wants to undergo the knife finally in November I think it was like November November 3rd or 4th I uh went to go see Dr. Krenchek in Cincinnati and he diagnosed it as a torn UCL had surgery the next week right after uh the Omaha challenge so what was the rehab process like we kind of based my rehab process off of Kyle Hart's. Um, um, I mean, Joel, our athletic trainer, has been through a couple torn UCLs, and it was kind of comforting knowing that he knew what he was talking about. I really trusted what he had to do, and I really just kind of dove into it head first. Um, I knew that if I was timid, that I was going to come back and I was going to throw timid, so I kind of just I took it as I can go at this thing full speed ahead or I can kind of lay off the gas and be scared to come back and scared to throw harder and all that type of stuff. So, yeah. And how was it adjusting to returning to uh, full play the next season? It was, it was weird. Um, coming out of high school and being like the second commit definitely like put a little bit of pressure, I think, on myself. Um, so when I came back from surgery, prolonging another year, I think I just added a lot more pressure to myself. And guys like, I mean, we had guys like uh, Paulie Milto, Andrew Saul Frank at that time, Matt Lloyd, like kind of trying to keep up with guys like that. It's just like, you just, it was a little hectic for me, I guess little stressful but Matt Lloyd helped me out a ton I mean just with getting my confidence back because he's been through the whole Tommy and John thing as well so having him having Paulie Milto Andrew Saul Frank those guys like really helped me a lot just kind of gain confidence in myself again so Matt yeah you've been a part of the bullpen during your time here at IU uh was the change from starting difficult for you to make it was difficult for me to make just because my mechanics just weren't there, really. I wasn't – I was a slow-to-the-plate guy. I kind of just, like, rear back and threw as hard as I could. And being a reliever, obviously, you need to be able to hold the run game. You come in in big situations. You got to execute three pitches for a strike. And I just don't think I was there yet until I really got to work with Coach Parker, uh, developing that mindset of – being a reliever, being a starter, you got to be able to really know your limits, know how to, how your body's going to take six, seven, eight innings. Being a reliever, I kind of just, I would almost be like a little lax going into the game because I had always really planned on going six or seven innings, but working with Parker, he really helped me iron out the small things, really fix my mindset into you're going to go in the game. You're going to get your three outs maybe six outs if you're cruising and then uh we're gonna pull you and go to a different guy or if i'm lucky enough to be at the end of the game and that leads to millionaires right we say that major league job is a beautiful one if you can get it right <laughs> what, what pitch did you have to drop uh from starter to relief so when i first stepped on campus well, it, it was actually my four seam to be honest i uh it just didn't play at the college level um, I learned that really quickly, actually. The first pitch I threw as a college uh, pitcher, Matt Lloyd took it 400 feet. Oof. So, yeah. <laughs> that was a wake-up call, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, so I really changed to, like, a sinker. Um, me and Parker really just worked on that. And it honestly started to take – I took a hold to it, and it really started working for me. I made it basically my bread-and-butter pitch. And I picked up the slider. He changed it from curveball to slider when I first started working with him, which I had no business throwing a curveball. It was no good. And then the changeup has really come around a lot. I knew that I would need to be able to throw one 
if you're going to be a draft guy, you're going to need to throw a changeup. So I really, this summer, tried to iron out a changeup and make it a pitch that I could actually throw for outs instead of just a get me over, stay off my fastball type pitch. Nice. Now, during the summer, you got a, a national attention for that heater. I know that. Uh, D1 was at a bunch of those making bacon games. So your name came up a lot. Does that give you more pressure, like the next time you take the mound after seeing something like that from them? Um, no, I, I wouldn't say it's more pressure. I honestly, I think it, I think of it as like a little bit more motivation just because coming back from, uh, the surgery, I, I mean, the no confidence thing, it really took a lot. It took a lot for me to get back on the horse and have all the confidence that I do now. So when I look at things like that, it almost just kind of like fuels me a little bit just to know that. I came back from that and that this stuff's the byproduct of the work that I've been putting in. So it's actually, it's very m motivating. Yeah. I like it. I like it. Now I'm glad you brought up the slider because we saw some video from PRP where they split your heater and your slider 94 for the heater, 80 for the slider, but they look the same and your, your mechanics pretty much look the same. How difficult is that to do to hide from the batter? I mean, these two pitches were nowhere close. Like how do you, um, what's the hardest part of doing that? It's just kind of like, for me personally, I needed to learn how to tunnel the pitches, um, obviously. And the hardest part for that, I guess, is just knowing how to use your stuff. My, I knew that my slider wasn't a true slider back, uh, I, I would say last year, to be honest, it wasn't a true slider. It was kind of just to get me over pitch to, stay off my sinker but me and brain scott we really took covid and we used it to improve our weaknesses and i think that what we did in uh, our covid days was really try to figure out what tunneling really is how to make the pitches really tunnel better and really use the pitches to our strengths instead of just here i'm gonna put in the strike zone see if you can hit it type of thing So you've already mentioned a few people that have helped you, particularly your, your other teammates, but just in general, who's helped you the most in your baseball career? I mean, it's a long list, that's for sure. But um, I would, the most I would probably have to say, it'd be probably Merce. Um, he, when I was first coming back and I was struggling my first, my redshirt freshman year, I really like, kind of was just a jerk and like bad teammate type of guy just like kind of just tried to like hide from uh the pressure and Merce kind of just pulled me off to the side and like kind of gave me a little hey you're gonna figure it out or you're uh not gonna be seeing the mound anytime soon so him really treating us like we're adults and like but yet treating us with the same respect that he would treat like his own kid. It just, I think that that really just motivated me a lot into like what I turned into now and like trying to have the confidence that he really feels in us in all of us, whether it's Cole Barr third or Brennan Rowe, the freshman, he just, it distills like this confidence in each one of his players that whatever position you are, that you're going to be able to go out there and you're going to be able to do your job. So now that we've gotten a little bit of fall ball going, uh, which of the newcomers to the Ross roster are you most looking forward to see take the mound in 2021? I would have to say I'm excited to see Alex. Uh, we call him Alex Lagoo. Uh, Log Logish. We still don't know how to say his last name, but so we call him Lagoo. Uh, he's actually, I mean, he was, he came in, he had a little dead arm. Not, I mean, it happens to every freshman. You're not used to the volume of throwing. Uh, so he actually just started throwing his first couple live innings and he's made the most out of them. So I'm excited to see him throw. Casper Clark's a, a big guy who really, I mean, he's competed at every level. So also I think Craig Yoho, the uh, Houston transfer, he's actually been throwing a couple bullpens and he's looked good. So I'm excited to see him throw as well. 
So switching gears here to the academic side of what you do, um, you've made back-to-back -back all Big Ten. Uh, what's the hardest part of making sure you hit the books as hard as you can hit the catcher's mitt? Um, uh, I just think, like, if you take pride in all aspects of your life, I think that it's just going to make all those other aspects follow suit. So I just think that if you're going to do something, you may as well do it with as much as you got. So I just take academics very seriously. The all academic big 10, I just didn't, I didn't really even know about it to be honest until I was nominated for the first time and I wanted to stay up there. So I kept going. So, so what's your major? Uh, sport management and marketing. Do you have any future plans with that? I like to stay in baseball as long as possible, to be honest. I'm not, I know that probably sounds cliche, but uh, I'd love to be a pitching coach at some point in my life. If not that, then kind of do what uh, D-Man, Den Sagerman does. So I like the operation side of it as well, kind of get to help the players with everything they need. I think that would be cool. He's like a rocket scientist too, right? Oh, my God. He's the – He's the smartest guy I've ever met. Yeah. No, I think he yeah. might be literally a rocket scientist. No, he is. He's got like nine degrees in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't even pronounce the word. So he's got the degrees in. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I'm glad he's on our side. I always say it. I am glad we have him oh, and we're not hearing about me. him from another team. Yeah, it's amazing. Like, we'll, we'll show up to the field and, like, we'll have like these charts that no one ever knew about, like even existed. And like, he'd be like doing like the, we just got one of the new uh, Egotronic cameras or something like that, that overlay the pitches and stuff. And he's figuring out all that. And it's just, it's way over my head. That's for sure. Those are wild though. Those make you, I mean, it is the hardest thing to do in baseball is to, I mean, sports is to hit a baseball. When you watch those Tronic, uh, when the ball just splits, like, oh, there's four of them. Like, here's my four pitches. Oh, yeah. How do you know where to hit it? I don't know. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, uh, I don't it's, – it's crazy. Following this up, just our last one, I see you've got the White Sox hat on. I saw a lot of uh, White Sox stuff on your social media, so I had to ask because, to be honest, I'm a Mets fan, so I like White Sox fans because it's kind of like the, the Met Yankee Cub White Sox thing, so I always have a little exactly. bit of White Sox. So for you, though, why did you go White Sox uh, instead of Cubs? Um, my, all my whole family has diehard White Sox fans. And, and I don't know, I've always, I've always just kind of enjoyed the White Sox more than the Cubs. I, I just, I've always thought of the Cubs as like, uh, the white collar workers and like the White Sox, like the, the little like blue collar workers who just kind of put their head down and get the job done. Even though recently they haven't been really getting the job done other than this last year, but I don't know. It's always been like that little rival, rival, rivalry around us that uh, really just kind of keeps things fun. All my friends are Cubs fans, though. So. Yeah, I was surrounded by a lot of Yankee fans, too. I didn't like it. No. I was going to say, I feel your pain on that one as a Cardinals fan who grew up in Cubby country. Oh, yeah. No. I. Oh, yeah, no. I can't. I, I got to admit, though, I did go to the Cubs parade. Uh it was kind of cool to see that many people in the city of Chicago. I mean, I'm talking, you walk down any street and you're shoulder to shoulder with four or five people. I actually had my buddy's uh, little sister. We had to tie her to me to make sure that she didn't get lost in the crowd. No, <laughs> you had a leash. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I'm you know, listen again. I'm always I always favor towards the whites. I know the Cubs got Schwarber, and of course we root for him. But team wise, I always kind of take that second tier team just because I've yeah. been doing it for my whole life. So I'm exactly. glad you stuck with him. He didn't give in to any of the pressure. Oh no, never. <laughs> and now you got a bunch of Hoosiers, right? I mean, Stever, oh, Dilo, yeah. uh, Milto. I remember. Uh, yeah, actually, Dilo was a. Uh, yeah, uh, Dilo. I got to actually catch up with him somewhat recently. I got to talk to him because he's actually from right down the street from where I'm from. And then Paulie, I got to catch up with too. He's always a fun one to catch up with. And then seeing Jonathan Stever make his debut, it's just kind of cool to right. know all these like professional athletes that play for your favorite team. So nice. 
So Matt, you uh, talked about uh, Coach Lamonis and Coach Bunn, and then also Coach Mercer and Coach Parker. Um, you went through that transition coaching change. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, that? And was that difficult for you to do? Yeah, it was a, it was a weird change because um, Lamonis is being the great guy that he is. He, I remember we actually found out from social media first and he actually called in a team meeting as soon as he found out that we knew and he just, he felt so bad about it. And I just remember that first talk that he had with us and like that feeling of like, he felt like he betrayed us when realistically, I mean, he's a great coach. He's going to go and he's going to do what coaches do. I mean, down in Mississippi State, but when we were, I remember we were sitting at, uh, me and Tommy, we were sitting at Bub's, the burger place, and um, if Merce asked, I got a, like, a vegan burger with, like, no fries or anything, but um, I, uh, I remember we were sitting there, and we were kind of keeping up with, like, the coaching uh, changes and whatnot, but when we found out that it was Mercer, we didn't really know much about him other than he was coming over from Wright State. We knew of Justin Parker just because um, Tommy knew a lot more about him than I did. But it wasn't too hard of a change, I would say, just because Coach Parker and Coach Mercer made it really easy to kind of – they kind of let us be us for a little bit and then slowly implement their – ruling which I think helped a lot because we had a lot of uh, older leadership in the Paul and Milto the Andrew Saul Frank the Tanner Gordon came over from John A that year it was just like we had a lot of older guys who were, were kind of I'm not going to say stuck in their way but we're taught one way for so long that it was kind of just like you can't just make them turn not like around in a 180 degrees and like do what you need them to do well, that will do it for this edition of Talking Hoosier Baseball. I uh, wanted to thank Matt Litwicky for joining us this evening. Thank you very much. Um, read up on Indiana Baseball at iubase.com. Uh, follow us and hit us up on Twitter at CU at the Bart and at iubase17. Uh, on Instagram, it's iubase. Uh, to get updates on our premier events, uh, you can subscribe to the Talking Hoosier Baseball channel on YouTube. Uh, this includes these video podcasts game clips, uh, game day media availabilities, and more. Uh, for Chris Feeney, Josh Bennett, Cassidy Palmer, and Matt Litwicky, I am Carl James. See you at the BART. Bye.